Tim Carroll. I'm the Artistic Director of the Shaw Festival. We've been working away for the last couple of weeks, as you may know, even though we're in increasing degrees of isolation and we're all observing it very carefully, as I hope you are. Uh, we're going to get through this, of course, and to the other side of it, and we can't wait to be on the other side of it and to be able to share some of this incredible work with you. In the meantime, we're thinking of ways to use the online uh, facility to show you some of what we've been doing. Soon, you'll be seeing actors and singers and performers uh, putting little bits of content online for you, but we have to organize that with unions and so on. So in the meantime, it was suggested to me that I should read my adaptation of Flush, since I'm uh, just a director and I can do whatever I like. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to read it to you now. It takes about half an hour to read. I will read in a few stage directions, but not many. Just enough, I hope, for you to understand what's going on. You might want to know before we start that Flush is Virginia Woolf's biography of a dog. It's uh, written in a very funny um, quasi-academic biographical style and purports only to be the life story of Flush, but of course obliquely tells the very romantic and beautiful story of the love affair and subsequent elopement and marriage of two great poets, Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning. So if you're sitting comfortably, here's Flush. It is universally admitted that the family from which the subject of this memoir claims descent is one of the greatest antiquity. Therefore, it is not strange that the origin of the name itself is lost in obscurity. Many million years ago, the country which is now called Spain seethed uneasily in the ferment of creation. Ages passed, vegetation appeared, where there is vegetation, the law of nature has decreed that there shall be rabbits. Where there are rabbits, providence has ordained there shall be dogs. There is nothing in this that calls for question or comment, but when we ask why the dog that caught the rabbit was called a spaniel, then doubts and difficulties begin. Some historians say that when the Carthaginians landed in Spain, the common soldiers shouted with one accord, span, span, for rabbits darted from every scrub, from every bush. The land was alive with rabbits, and span, in the Carthaginian tongue, signifies rabbit. Thus the land was called Hispania, or rabbit land, and the dogs, which were almost instantly perceived in full pursuit of the rabbits, were called spaniels, or rabbit dogs. There many of us would be content to let the matter rest, but truth compels us to add that there is another school of thought which thinks differently. The word Hispania, these scholars say, has nothing whatever to do with the Carthaginian word span. Hispania derives from the Basque word España, signifying an edge or boundary. If that is so, rabbits, bushes, dogs, soldiers, the whole of that romantic and pleasant picture must be dismissed from the mind, and we must simply suppose that the Spaniel is called a Spaniel because Spain is called España. As for the third school of antiquaries, which maintains that just as a lover calls his mistress monstrous or monkey, so the Spaniards call their favourite dogs crooked or cragged, the word espana can be made to take these meanings, because a spaniel is notoriously the opposite, that is too fanciful a conjecture to be seriously entertained. Passing over these theories, we reach Wales in the middle of the 10th century. The spaniel is already there, and already a dog of high repute and value. It is laid down in Howell Dar's Book of Laws that the spaniel of the king is a pound in value. And when we remember what the pound could buy in the year AD 948, how many wives, slaves, horses, oxen, turkeys and geese, it is plain that the spaniel was already a dog of value and reputation. He had his place already by the king's side. He was taking his ease in palaces when the Plantagenets and the Tudors and the Stuarts were following other people's ploughs through other people's mud. By the time of Queen Elizabeth, a clear hierarchy has emerged. Sir Philip Sidney writes of greyhounds, spaniels, and hounds, whereof the first might seem the lords, the second the gentlemen, and the last the yeomen of dogs. But if we assume that the Spaniels followed human example and looked up to greyhounds as their superiors and considered hounds beneath them, we have to admit that their aristocracy was founded on better reasons than ours. Such at least must be the conclusion of anyone who studies the laws of the Spaniel Club. By that august body it is plainly laid down what constitute the vices of a Spaniel and what constitute its virtues. Light eyes, for example, are undesirable. 
curled ears are still worse. To be born with a light nose or a top knot is nothing less than fatal. The merits of the spaniel are equally clearly defined. His head must be smooth, the skull comparatively rounded, and the eyes full but not gozzled. The spaniel that exhibits these points is encouraged and bred from. The spaniel who persists in perpetuating top knots and light noses is cut off from the privileges and emoluments of its kind. Thus the judges lay down the law and ensure that the law shall be obeyed. But if we now turn to human society, what chaos and confusion meet the eye? No club has any such jurisdiction upon the breed of man. When we ask what constitutes noble birth, should our eyes be light or dark, our ears curled or straight, our top knots fatal, the College of Heralds merely refers us to our coats of arms. If you have none, you are nobody. But when we look around us and see whose coats of arms are noble, even royal, we can but shake our heads and admit that the judges of the Spaniel Club judged better. All researchers have failed to fix with any certainty the exact year of Flush's birth, let alone the month or the day, but it is likely that he was born sometime early in the year 1842. The first months of his life were passed in a cottage near Reading. Since his owner, Miss Mitford, had fallen on evil days, it is unlikely that Flush was surrounded by any of the luxuries that would now be accorded a dog of his rank. But what did he care? What more could a puppy wish for than to walk through the fields? Cool globes of dew breaking from the long grass in showers of iridescent spray about his nose. The earth, here hard, here soft, here hot, here cold, stung, teased and tickled the soft pads of his feet. Then what a variety of smells interwoven in subtlest combination thrilled his nostrils. Strong smells of earth, sweet smells of flowers, nameless smells of leaf and bramble, sour smells as they crossed the road, pungent smells as they entered bean fields. But suddenly, down the wind, came tearing a sharper, stronger smell. A smell that ripped across his brain, stirring a thousand instincts, releasing a million memories, the smell of rabbit. Off he flashed like a fish drawn through water. He heard dark men cry, span, span. He forgot his mistress. He forgot all humankind. One day, probably in the early summer of the year 1842, a remarkable couple might have been seen taking their way down Wimpole Street. A very short, stout, shabby, elderly lady with a bright red face and bright white hair who led by the chain a very spirited, very inquisitive, very well-bred golden cocker spaniel puppy. They walked almost the whole length of the street until at last they paused at number 50. Not without trepidation, Miss Mitford rang the bell. Even now, perhaps, nobody rings the bell of a house in Wimpole Street without trepidation. It is the most august and forbidding of London streets. Indeed, when the world seems tumbling to ruin and civilization rocks on its foundations, one has only to go to Wimpole Street, to survey the uniformity of the houses, to marvel at the window curtains and their consistency, to observe butchers tendering joints and cooks receiving them, to reckon the incomes of the inhabitants one has only to go to Wimpole Street and drink deep of the peace breathed by authority in order to heave a sigh of thankfulness that, while Corinth has fallen and Messina has tumbled, while crowns have blown down the wind and old empires have gone up in flames, Wimpole Street has remained unmoved. A prayer rises in the heart and bursts from the lips that not a brick of Wimpole Street may be repointed, not a curtain washed, not a butcher fail to tender or a cook to receive the joints of mutton and beef forever and ever, for as long as Wimpole Street remains, civilization is secure. Up the funnel of the staircase, as Flush ascended behind Miss Mitford, came warm whiffs of joints roasting, of fowls basting, of soups simmering, mixed with smells of cedarwood and sandalwood and mahogany, scents of male bodies and female bodies, of men servants and maid servants, of coats and trousers, of coal dust and fog, of wine and cigars. Each room as he passed it, dining room, drawing room, library, bedroom, wafted out its own contribution to the general stew. While, as he set down first one paw and then another, each was caressed and retained by the sensuality of rich pile carpets closing amorously over it. At length, they reached a closed door at the back of the house. Gentle tap on the door. 
At first, Flush could distinguish nothing in the pale greenish gloom but five white globes glimmering mysteriously in mid-air. But again it was the smell of the room that overpowered him. Only a scholar who has descended step by step into a mausoleum and there finds himself in a crypt, crusted with fungus, slimy with mould, where nothing can be seen but by the light of the small swinging lamp which he holds, only the sensations of such an explorer into the buried vaults of a ruined city can compare with the riot of emotions that flooded Flush's nerves as he stood for the first time in an invalid's bedroom in Wimpole Street and smelt eau de cologne. As he investigated this new world, Flush scarcely heard, save as the distant drone of wind among the treetops, the murmur and patter of voices talking. But when the voices ceased, the sound of a door shutting, for one instant he paused, bewildered, unstrung. Then with a pounce as of clawed tigers, memory fell upon him. He felt himself alone, deserted. He rushed to the door. It was shut. He poured. He listened. He heard footsteps descending. He knew them for the familiar footsteps of his mistress. They stopped. But no, on they went. Down they went. Miss Mitford was slowly, was heavily descending the stairs. And as she went, as he heard her footsteps fade, panic seized upon him. Door after door shut in his face as Miss Mitford went downstairs. They shut on freedom, on fields, on rabbits, on grass, on his adored mistress, on all he had known of happiness and love and human goodness. He was alone. She had deserted him. A voice called his name. He did not hear it. It called a second time. He started. He had thought himself alone. Was there something alive in the room with him? Was there something on the sofa? In the wild hope that this being, whatever it was, might open the door, that he might still rush after Miss Mitford and find her, that this was some game of hide-and-seek such as they used to play at home, Flush darted to the sofa. And we, we can't yet see Elizabeth Barrett's face, but we see Flush looking into her eyes as we describe her. Hers was the pale, worn face of an invalid, cut off from air, light, freedom, his was the warm, ruddy face of a young animal, instinct with health and energy. Broken asunder, yet made in the same mould, could it be that each completed what was dormant in the other? But no. Between them lay the widest gulf that can separate one being from another. She spoke. He was dumb. She was woman. He was dog. Thus closely united, thus immensely divided, they gazed at each other. Flush sprang onto the sofa and laid himself where he was to lie forever after, on the rug at Miss Barrett's feet. And then we have a little musical passage where we do a bit of passage of time. We see uh, Elizabeth Barrett's father, Mr. Barrett, coming in to check on her and generally keeping her under his thumb. And time has passed. 1842 had turned into 1845. Flush was no longer a puppy. He was a dog of four or five, a dog in the full prime of life, and still Miss Barrett lay on her sofa in Wimpole Street, and still Flush lay on the sofa at her feet. Miss Barrett's life was the life of a bird in its cage. She sometimes kept the house for weeks at a time, and when she left it, it was only for an hour or two to drive to a shop in a carriage or to be wheeled to Regent's Park in a bath chair. The Barretts never left London, and Mr. Barrett came every night to sit with her in grim silence, sometimes, for no apparent reason, kneeling beside her with his hands clasped and his head bowed. Nothing changed. Nothing could ever change. But the letter that arrived in January 1845 was something new. Flush saw that even before the envelope was broken. Now Flush paid the full price of long years of accumulated sensibility lying couched on cushions at Miss Barrett's feet. He could read signs that nobody else could even see. He could tell by the touch of Miss Barrett's fingers that she was waiting for one thing only, for the postman's knock, for the letter on the tray. As the envelopes came more and more regularly, night after night, Flush began to notice signs of change in Miss Barrett herself. For the first time in Flush's experience, she was irritable and restless. He could feel it. Something was coming. It seemed that nothing could stop it, this horror, this terror that Miss Barrett dreaded and that Flush dreaded too. And then, on the 21st of May, 
and we have a musical section of the first visit of Robert Browning to Elizabeth Barrett after he's left. That night, Miss Barrett ate her chicken to the bone. Not a scrap of potato or of skin was thrown to Flush. When Mr. Barrett came as usual that evening, Flush marvelled at his obtuseness. He sat himself down in the very chair that the man had sat in. His head pressed the same cushions that the man's had pressed, and yet he noticed nothing. Don't you know, Flush marvelled, who's been sitting in that chair? Can't you smell him? For to Flush the whole room still reeked of Mr. Browning's presence. But the heavy man sat by his daughter in entire self-absorption. He noticed nothing. He suspected nothing. Though he could make no sense of the words that hurtled over his head from 2.30 to 4.30, sometimes three times a week, he could detect with terrible accuracy that their tone was changing. Miss Barrett's voice had been forced and unnaturally lively at first. Now it had gained a warmth and an ease that he had never heard in it before. And every time the man came, some new sound came into their voices. Now Miss Barrett's voice, rising, went soaring and circling in the air. And then Mr. Browning's voice barked out its sharp, harsh clapper of laughter. And then there was only a murmur, a quiet humming sound as the two voices joined together. But as the summer turned to autumn, Flush noted with a horrid apprehension another note. There was a new urgency, a new pressure and energy in the man's voice, at which Miss Barrett, Flush felt, took fright. Her voice fluttered, hesitated, seemed to falter and gasp, as if she were afraid. Flush might have been a log of wood for all the attention Mr. Browning paid him. Sometimes he scrubbed his head in a brisk, spasmodic way, energetically, without sentiment, as he passed him. Whatever that scrub might mean, Flush felt nothing but an intense dislike for Mr. Browning. The very sight of him, so well-tailored, so tight, so muscular, screwing his yellow gloves in his hand, set his teeth on edge. And then we have a little musical sequence in which I'm, a, I'm afraid Flush bites Robert Browning and uh, is in trouble with Elizabeth, but of course she forgives him. The winter passed and spring came round again. Flush could see no end to the affair. And yet, just as a placid river moves inevitably to a waterfall, so those days, Flush knew, were moving to catastrophe. He could hear it in the sound of Miss Barrett's voice that had been pleading and afraid. Now it had lost its faltering note and rang out with a boldness that Flush had never heard in it before. He determined to make one last attempt to regain her favour and perhaps oust the newcomer. And in this sequence, uh, Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett are dancing and Flush deliberately puts his paw under Browning's foot to get it stepped on. He holds up his paw, howling piteously, expecting Elizabeth to be angry with Browning, uh, but instead she just laughs at Flush. To be scolded was one thing, to be laughed at quite another. And Flush waits until the door is open and bolts through it. He was out of the house in a flash. He ran he knew not where and soon found himself in Regent's Park. The flowers smelt bitter to him, the grass burnt his paws, the dust filled his nostrils with disillusion. But he raced on. Dogs must be led on chains. There was the usual placard. There were the park keepers with their top hats and their truncheons to enforce it. But must no longer had any meaning for him. The chain of love was broken. He would run where he liked, chase partridges, splash into the middle of dahlia beds, break the red and yellow roses, let the park keepers throw their truncheons if they chose, let them dash his brains out, let him fall dead, disemboweled at Miss Barrett's feet. He cared nothing. But naturally nothing of the kind happened. Nobody pursued him. Nobody noticed him. There was nothing for it but to make his way back to Wimpole Street. A pair of hands reaches down and picks up Flush. Suddenly he was tumbled into darkness. The doors of a dungeon shut upon him. He had been stolen. Nothing, it is true, could exceed the apparent solidity and security of Wimpole Street. As far as an invalid could walk or a bath chair could trundle, nothing met the eye but an agreeable prospect of four-storied houses, plate glass windows and mahogany doors. And yet when Mr Thomas Beams, author of The Rookeries of London, took it into his head to go walking about the capital, he was surprised. Indeed, he was shocked. 
Splendid buildings raised themselves in Westminster, yet just behind them were ruined sheds in which human beings lived herded together above herds of cows, two in each seven feet of space. He felt that he ought to tell people what he had seen, yet how could one describe politely a bedroom in which two or three families lived above a cowshed, when the cowshed had no ventilation, when the cows were milked and killed and eaten under the bedroom? That was a task, as Mr. Beams found when he came to attempt it, that taxed all the resources of the English language. And yet he felt that he ought to describe what he had seen. The rich could not know what dangers they were running. For instance, here was an old mansion formerly belonging to some great nobleman. The rooms were panelled and the banisters were carved, and yet the floors were rotten. The walls dripped with filth. Hordes of half-naked men and women had taken up their lodging in the old banqueting halls. The rain dripped through the roof and the wind blew through the walls. He saw a child dipping a can into a bright green stream and asked if they drank that water. Oh yes, and washed in it too. Behind Miss Barrett's bedroom was St Giles' Rookery, one of the worst slums in London. The name was apt, for there human beings swarmed on top of each other as rooks swarm and blacken treetops. All day the lanes buzzed with half-dressed human beings. At night there poured back again into the stream the thieves, beggars and prostitutes who had been plying their trade in the West End. The police could do nothing. No single wayfarer could do anything except hurry through as fast as he could and perhaps drop a hint, as Mr Beams did with many evasions and euphemisms, that all was not quite as it should be. Cholera would come, and perhaps the hint that cholera would give would not be quite so evasive. But in the summer of 1846, that hint had not yet been given, and the only safe course for those who lived in Wimpole Street was to keep strictly within the respectable area and to lead your dog on a chain. The terms upon which Wimpole Street lived cheek by jowl with St Giles's were laid down. St Giles stole what St Giles could. Wimpole Street paid what Wimpole Street must. Ten pounds, it was reckoned, was about the price that Mr Taylor would ask for a cocker spaniel. Mr Taylor was the head of the gang. As soon as a lady in Wimpole Street lost her dog, she went to Mr Taylor. He named his price and it was paid. Or if not, a brown paper parcel was delivered in Wimpole Street a few days later, containing the head and paws of the dog. Such at least had been the experience of a lady in the neighbourhood who had tried to make terms with Mr Taylor. We now see Flush in the thieves' cellar, tied by the leg to a table. The morning of Wednesday the 2nd September dawned in the rookery. The broken windows gradually became smeared with grey. Light fell upon the hairy faces of ruffians lying sprawled upon the floor. Flush woke from a trance that had veiled his eyes and once more realised the truth. This was now the truth. This room, these ruffians, these whining, snapping, tightly tethered dogs, this murk, this dampness. Could it be true that he had been among ladies and ribbons only yesterday? Was there such a place as Wimpole Street? Was there a room where fresh water sparkled in a purple jar? Had he lain on cushions? Had he been given a chicken's wing nicely roasted? And had he been torn with rage and jealousy and bitten a man with yellow gloves? The whole of that life and its emotions floated away, dissolved, became unreal. All Flush's past life and its many scenes had faded like snowflakes dissolved in a cauldron. If he still held to hope, it was to something nameless and formless, the featureless face of someone he loved. All the rest of the world was gone, but she still existed, though such gulfs lay between them that it, it was impossible almost that she should reach him now. Darkness began to fall again, such darkness as seemed almost able to crush out his last hope, Miss Barrett. Saturday was the fifth day of Flush's imprisonment. Almost exhausted, almost hopeless, he lay panting in his dark corner of the teeming floor. And as he lay there, he went through one of those whirlpools of tumultuous emotion in which the soul is either dashed upon the rocks and splintered or, finding some tuft of foothold, slowly and painfully pulls itself up, regains dry land, and at last emerges on top of a ruined universe to survey a world created afresh on a different plan. Twice Flush had done his utmost to kill his enemy. Twice he had failed. And why had he failed, he asked himself. Because he loved Miss Barrett. But things are not simple. If he bit Mr Browning, he bit her too. 
Hatred is not hatred. Hatred is also love. Mr. Browning was Miss Barrett. Miss Barrett was Mr. Browning. Love is hatred, and hatred is love. Exhausted as he was, Flush submitted. He swore that he would love Mr. Browning and not bite him for the future. And then the door opens. He's given up looking up each time the door opens, but this time he is, in fact, dragged out. Like an iron bar, corroding and festering and killing all natural life beneath it, hatred had lain all these months across his soul. Now, by the cutting of sharp knives and painful surgery, the iron had been excised, and he was ready for whatever came, be it death or freedom. He thinks he's being dragged to his death, but of course, he's taken back to Elizabeth's bedroom. And uh, the first thing that he does is rush to his water jar and start drinking from it. Soon his strength returned to him, and as he lay on the sofa at Miss Barrett's feet, glory and delight coursed through his veins. He was with them, not against them now. Their hopes, their wishes, their desires were his. All three conspirators in the most glorious of causes, joined in sympathy, joined in defiance of tyranny, joined in love. Elizabeth reaches out to Pat Flush and we see the wedding ring on her finger. She also notices that she has forgotten to hide it and takes it off. The life of the bedroom went on as usual. The servants came in and out as usual. Mr. Barrett came as usual in the evening. He looked as usual to see that the chop was finished, the wine drunk. Miss Barrett talked and laughed and gave no sign when anyone was in the room that she was hiding anything. Yet when they were alone, she pulled out a box from under the bed and filled it hastily, stealthily, listening as she did so. And one night in the darkness, Flush woke to see Wilson come stealthily into the room, take the box from beneath the bed and quietly carry it outside. All Saturday morning he lay as one lies who knows that at any moment now a handkerchief may drop, a low whistle may sound and the signal will be given for death or for life. He watched Miss Barrett dress herself. At a quarter to four, the door opened and Wilson came in. Then Miss Barrett lifted him in her arms. She rose and walked to the door. For a moment, they stopped at the door. There was the sofa and by it, Mr. Browning's armchair. There were the busts and the tables. The sun filtered through the ivy leaves and the lace curtain blew gently out. All was as usual. All seemed to expect a million more such moments to come to them. But for Miss Barrett and Flush, this was the last. Very quietly, Miss Barrett shut the door. Very quietly, they slipped downstairs, past the drawing room, the library, the dining room. All looked as they usually looked, smelt as they usually smelt. All were quiet as if sleeping in the hot September afternoon. They gained the front door and very quietly turned the handle. A cab was waiting outside. They climbed in. Flush sat on her knee, very still. Not for anything in the whole world would he have broken that tremendous silence. And then a musical sequence of the voyage to Italy, where Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning elope and uh, start their new life away from the tyranny of Mr. Barrett. The human nose is practically non-existent. The greatest poets in the world have smelt nothing but roses on the one hand and dung on the other. The infinite gradations that lie between are unrecorded. Yet it was in the world of smell that Flush mostly lived. Italy, to him, meant mainly a succession of new smells. He threaded his path through the squares and alleys of Florence by smell. Where they beat brass, where they bake bread, where the women sit combing their hair, where the bird cages are piled high on the causeway, where the wine spills itself in dark red stains on the pavement. Through smells of leather and garlic, he ran in and out, always with his nose to the ground, drinking in the essence, or in the air, vibrating with the aroma nor was his sense of touch much less acute. Florence, in its marmorial smoothness and in its gritty and cobbled roughness, received the lick of his tongue, the quiver of his shivering snout. Upon the infinitely sensitive pads of his feet, he took the clear stamp of proud Latin inscriptions. In these, the fullest, the freest, the happiest years of his life, he came to know Florence as no human being ever could. Flush soon became aware of a profound difference between Italy and England. In London, he could scarcely trot round to the pillar box without meeting some 
pug dog, retriever, bulldog, mastiff, collie, Newfoundland, St. Bernard, fox terrier, or one of the se seven famous families of the Spaniel tribe. To each he gave a different name and to each a different rank. But here in Florence, though dogs abounded, there were no ranks. All, could it be possible, were mongrels. As far as he could see, they were dogs merely. Grey dogs, yellow dogs, brindled dogs, spotted dogs, but it was impossible to detect a single spaniel, collie, retriever or mastiff among them. Had the spaniel club then no jurisdiction in Italy? Was there no law which decreed death to the top knot, but cherished the straight ear and the feathered foot? Apparently not. Flush felt himself like a prince in exile. He was the only purebred cocker spaniel in the whole of Florence. There was an element, it must be admitted, of the snob in Flush. This is scarcely surprising when he had been taught for so many years to consider himself an aristocrat. But just as Mrs Browning, as she now was, was exploring her new freedom and delighting in the discoveries she made, so it was with Flush. The moment of liberation came one day in the Parco delle Cascine. As he raced over the grass, Flush suddenly bethought him of Regent's Park and its proclamation, dogs must be kept on chains. Well, where was must now? Where were chains now? Where were park keepers and truncheons gone? With the dog stealers and the spaniel clubs of a corrupt aristocracy. He ran, he raced, his coat flashed, his eyes blazed. He was the friend of all the world now. All dogs were his brothers. He had no need of a chain in this new world. He had no need of protection. If Mr Browning was late in going for his walk, he and Flush were the best of friends now, Flush boldly summoned him in the most imperious manner possible. But if Mr Browning preferred to stay at home and write, it did not matter. Flush was independent now. The Judas trees were burning bright in the gardens. The wild tulips were sprinkled in the fields. Why should he wait? Off he ran by himself. He was his own master now, and there were no dog stealers here in Florence. But to speak candidly, it was not to stare at pictures or to penetrate into dark churches and look up at dim frescoes that Flush scampered off when the door was left open. It was to enjoy something, it was in search of something, denied him all these years. We see a, a wagging tail which uh, Flush rather shamelessly goes off in pursuit of. Flush knew what man can never know, love pure, love simple, love entire, love that brings no train of care in its wake that has no shame, no remorse, that is here, that is gone, as the bee on the flower is here and is gone. So variously, so carelessly, Flush embraced the spotted spaniel down the alley and the brindled dog and the yellow dog, it did not matter which. To Flush it was all the same. He followed the horn of Venus wherever the horn blew and the wind wafted it. Love was all. Love was enough. No one blamed him for his escapades or passed comment when Flush returned very late at night or early the next morning. We see Flush returning home and curling up to sleep next to Elizabeth, who is now cradling a baby. But though it would be pleasant for the biographer to infer that Flush's life in late middle age was one long orgy of pleasure, it would not be true. With a cruel irony, the sun that ripened the delicious grapes of Italy brought also the fleas. Fleas leapt to life in every corner of the Florentine houses. They skipped and hopped out of every cranny of the old stone, out of every fold of old tapestry, out of every cloak, hat and blanket. They nested in Flush's fur. They bit their way into the thickest of his coat. He scratched and tore. His health suffered. He became morose, thin and feverish. Mr. and Mrs. Browning went down on their knees beside a pail of water and did their best to exorcise the pest with soap and scrubbing brush. It was in vain. Only one remedy remained, but it was a remedy that was almost as drastic as the disease itself. However democratic Flush had become and careless of the signs of rank, he still remained what Philip Sidney had called him, a gentleman by birth. He carried his pedigree on his back. His coat meant to him what a gold watch inscribed with the family arms means to an impoverished squire whose broad acres have shrunk to that single circle. And we see a pair of scissors and Flush is indeed clipped and appears hairless. Flush felt himself emasculated, diminished, ashamed. 
He was nobody. Certainly he was no longer a cocker spaniel. But there could be no doubt that he was free from fleas. <sighs> so might a great beauty, rising from a bed of sickness and finding her face eternally disfigured, make a bonfire of clothes and cosmetics and laugh with joy to think that she need never look in the glass again or dread a lover's coolness or a rival's beauty. So might a clergyman, cased for twenty years in starch and broadcloth, cast his collar into the dustbin and snatch the works of Voltaire from the cupboard. The Greeks had a saying, happiness is only to be reached through suffering. The true philosopher is he who has lost his coat but is free from the fleas. Flush was growing an old dog now, stretched beneath a statue, couched under the lip of a fountain for the sake of the few drops that spurted now and again onto his coat. He would lie dozing by the hour. The young dogs would come about him. To them he would tell his stories of St Giles and Wimpole Street. He would describe the smell of clover and the smell of Oxford Street. He would rehearse his memories of one revolution and another, how grand dukes had come and grand dukes had gone, but the spotted spaniel down the alley on the left, she goes on forever, he would say. The peasant women in the marketplace made him a bed of leaves in the shadow of their baskets and tossed him a bunch of grapes now and then. He was known, he was liked by all Florence, gentle and simple, dogs and men. It was a blazing hot afternoon. The old market woman at the corner had fallen asleep over her melons. Flush lay beside her under the shadow of her great basket, watching the young dogs busy with their own affairs. They were snarling and biting, stretching and tumbling in all the abandonment of youthful joy. They were chasing each other in and out, round and round, as he had once chased the spotted spaniel in the alley. Well, he had had his day. He did not grudge them theirs. He had found the world a pleasant place to live in. He had no quarrel with it now. And he falls asleep and we see that his legs twitch. Was he dreaming that he hunted rabbits in Spain? Was he coursing up a hot hillside with dark men shouting, Span! Span! as the rabbits darted from the brushwood? Where did he think he was? In St Giles, among the ruffians? Suddenly we see him wake up. Was the knife at his throat again? We see him starting to run. He runs home, jumps onto the couch where Elizabeth is sitting. She's reading. She was growing old now and so was Flush. She bent down over him for a moment. Her face, with its wide mouth and its great eyes and its heavy curls, was still oddly like his. Broken asunder, yet made in the same mould, each perhaps completed what was dormant in the other. But she was woman, he was dog. And we see Flush fade out of life, and right at the end, for the first time, we hear a human voice as Elizabeth notices something and says, Flush? Flush? Robert? And that's the end.